My name is Zach Arnold. I'm a Hollywood film and television editor, a documentary director, father of two, an American Ninja Warrior in training, and the creator of Optimize Yourself. Whether you're a creative professional, an entrepreneur, a weekend warrior, or even a professional athlete, I strongly believe that it is no longer necessary to sacrifice your health in order to be successful. Throughout my own career, I have battled attention issues, anxiety, burnout, and back in 2005, after almost losing the battle with suicidal depression, I had had enough. I was done barely surviving. I wanted to thrive. Since then, I have obsessively searched for every possible way to optimize my own creative and athletic performance. And now I wanna shorten your learning curve so you can forge your own path to greatness without sacrificing your sanity in the process. You ready? Let's get started designing the optimized version of you. Hello, and welcome back to season two of the Optimize Yourself podcast and episode 50. I hope that you had a wonderful summer and that you are ready to take some action moving your life forwards for the last few months of 2018. In celebration of the launch of season two of this show, I have not one, not two, but three awesome episodes for you this week. Whether you're a first-time listener or a seasoned veteran, I'm grateful to have you here, and I appreciate you prioritizing this time in your day to allow me to inspire you to live just a bit further outside your comfort zone so you can feel empowered to realize your greatest potential. Now, to ensure that you don't miss future episodes, I invite you to subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or whatever app you prefer, because I have tons of great guests, giveaways, and free training coming your way on a weekly basis. Just visit optimizeyourself.me slash subscribe to make sure that you don't miss future episodes and to access our index of past episodes. Today's bonus episode is a raw recording of my recent appearance at the wonderful event Edit Fest in Los Angeles, where I was on a panel that was sponsored by Abbott Technology titled The Extended Cut, How to Survive and Thrive in Editorial. The panel was moderated by Matt Fury of Abbott Technology, and in addition to me, the panel also included Lillian Benson, who's an ACE officer and co-chair of the Diversity Committee, Carol Littleton, who's a member of the Board of Governors of the Academy, past president of the Motion Picture Editors Guild and an award-winning film editor, as well as Andy Seckler, who's an award-winning editor of Westworld, as well as one of the architects of the ACES Best Practices pamphlet. Now, this panel was a brutally honest and open look at what it really takes to not only survive, but thrive in Hollywood as a film editor. We talk about the brutally long hours, bouts with depression and burnout, issues with diversity on both an ethnic and a gender level, office politics, and the importance of not letting anybody steal your creative passion. This was a no-holds-barred conversation where no topic was too taboo. Now note, this is a raw recording of a live event, so I apologize for any inconsistencies in the audio quality, and no editing has been done to this recording. This is live and unfiltered. Now, before getting to the panel, I'd like to thank the company Adobe for not only supporting this podcast and the Optimize Yourself movement, but also for being kind enough to provide me with four yearly subscriptions to Adobe Creative Cloud that I can then give to you. Now, for those that might not be aware, Creative Cloud is an essential package of video creation tools such as Premiere, After Effects, and Audition. These are tools that I personally can't live without, whether I'm working in the web, in TV, or on film projects. To win yourself a yearly subscription to this awesome suite of creative tools, all you have to do is leave an honest review for this podcast in iTunes or Apple Podcasts. It is seriously that simple. I'm going to do one drawing per month for October, November, December, and January. To learn more about the great products that Adobe Creative Cloud has to offer, all you have to do is visit optimizeyourself.me slash adobe. And if that isn't enough to get you excited, you can also enter to win the 12-month pro plan from my newest sponsor, Frame.io. If you're not familiar with Frame.io, it is an amazing online collaboration tool where you can comment and interact directly with your videos, providing instant feedback rather than constantly going back and forth via endless email chains while you're doing revisions to your videos. And you know how I feel about email and productivity. To learn more about Frame.io, just visit optimizeyourself.me slash Frame.io. And for clarification, that's Frame.io with no periods or spaces. 
And don't forget to leave that podcast review on iTunes to be entered to win. All right, without further ado, after a brief break to recognize the sponsors who are literally making this episode possible for you today, here is the raw, unedited panel from EditFest 2018. This episode is made possible for you by ErgoDriven, the makers of the Topomat, my number one recommendation for anybody who stands at their workstation. The Topo is super comfortable, an awesome conversation starter, and it's also scientifically proven to help you move more throughout the day, which helps reduce discomfort and also increase your focus and productivity. To learn more and get your Topo mat, visit optimizeyourself.me slash Topo. That's T-O-P-O. This episode is also made possible for you by Sit Tight, my new number one recommendation if you're searching for a healthier, more ergonomically friendly office chair that turns sitting into an activity that actually improves your health rather than damaging it. Yes, you can actually get fit while you sit. If you've never seen one, just imagine the most comfortable bar stool on the planet on top of a BOSU ball. Eh, just trust me, it's awesome. If you want to learn more about how the sit tight can provide fitness for your body, focus for your mind, and fun for your spirit, just visit optimizeyourself.me slash sit tight and use the coupon code optimize for 10% off your order. And thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Ace, for um, giving Avid this opportunity to host this panel. Uh, I consider myself fortunate that I get to do a lot of these things and talk to a lot of different editors. And I can honestly say, I don't know how this one's going to go. Um, in, a, in a very good way. Um, it's, uh, there could be some brutal truths that come to the surface. I hope there are. Um, Steve did a great job of teeing everybody up, so uh, that saves me the trouble of doing that. Uh, but I'm going to just redo it a little bit anyway. Uh, and you might notice as we do this, I'm going to try and make a conscious effort not to talk about the films and television shows and documentaries and all the great work that you've done as individuals, because this panel really is about um, the career in general and about you know extending and having a nice, long, and fruitful, and hopefully happy career. I can say that I've been talking to a few editors this week as I've been here, and uh, I don't recall them being this um, pissed off. I'll say that. Um, <laughs> and we're not going to take it anymore. Yeah. It was, it's, it's pretty unsettling, and I don't like to hear that, so I'd like to see everybody much happier myself. Um, seated right next to me, of course, is Zach Arnold, and uh, among the distinctions that Zach has is the, his program, Optimize Yourself, that he is the visionary behind, uh, something you're going to be hearing more about, and it's a great effort and, and wonderful that he's doing that. Uh, Carol Littleton, oh, so we're out of order here, so you've got to stay in order. Um, Lillian Benson, Lillian. Um, not only is she a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, uh, an ACE officer, co-chair of the Diversity Committee, uh, but she is also the first African-American female editor selected for membership in the American Cinema Editors. And uh, I think that is an amazing thing. This is, as, as, I, as I teased her, this is a mantle she wears with grace and dignity and one I'm sure she wishes somebody else held much before her. Uh, Carol Littleton, uh, member of the Board of Governors of the Academy, past president of the Motion Picture Editors Guild. Maybe MPEG will come up a little bit today. Um, <laughs> and member of the ACE Board. Uh, Carol, also co-architect of the uh, fantastic yellow pamphlet, the ACE Best Practices Guide that Mr. Sackler has on his knee over there. And of course, Andrew Sackler, the other co-architect of the ACE Best Practices Guide. Um, all right, well, for our purposes, you're the architect. It's okay. Um, <laughs> Now, Zach, I want to start with you because um, you're one of the first people that I talked to and one of the driving forces behind um, the way this panel came together. And this panel did not come together um, very organically. It was one of those things that sort of just sort of went in different directions until it all came back together as this being this big picture thing about um, physical wellness, mental wellness, diversity, inclusion, um, how to take care of one another, how to take care of yourselves as editors, how to speak with one voice as editors, which apparently is a very needed thing right now. Uh, so, Zach, what, what prompted you to start this Optimize Yourself program? Why did, what was, the, was there a single defining moment where you said, I got to do something about this, or was it just gradually over time? 
Well, there's a single defining moment for me as a person um, or me as an extension of my machine, so to speak, because that's really where it all started. And for anybody that has uh, listened to the podcast or read my blogs, you're going to be like, oh my God, we know your story already. But there are probably some people here that have not heard it. So basically, I was about 25 years old. I was editing my first feature film, which was a huge opportunity for somebody at that age. I was just two years out of college. And I was working with a director for 16 hour days, seven days a week. So I was working out of my home, which I thought was a good thing until I realized that it basically chained me to my workstation 24 seven. She would knock on my door at 9 a.m. She would leave at 1 a.m. We would work through lunch, work through dinner, and I did this for seven or eight weeks straight. And as soon as I got a break, I started to have a complete total and mental breakdown. And I reached a point of suicidal depression. And I just remember sitting in my little office slash edit suite really late one night, the lights were off, and just thinking to myself with my head in my hands, I cannot live like this anymore. However, I love what I do for a living. There's nothing more exciting than sitting in front of an empty timeline and playing Tetris with colored blocks that translate to people's emotions. We play Tetris all day long to make people feel something. I love doing that. I'm so passionate about it. But I got this wake-up call that, oh my God, is this really what it's like to be an editor? Like, this is not what I expected at all. And I decided that what I wanted to do was stop treating myself like a Ford Pinto all day long. And I wanted to start treating myself like a Ferrari. But how do you do that? What does that actually mean? So it was really a journey of over a decade trying to learn everything I could about not just being a fantastic editor and a storyteller, but how can I be a high performance machine, which ultimately makes me a better storyteller, makes me more creative. And then as all the pieces started to come together, I would start to have colleagues come to me and they'd say, how do you have so much energy and how are you working these long hours? And you, you just seem fresh all the time. Like, that's not fair. Like we're all exhausted. And I realized, oh, maybe there are some people that, you know, I can talk to about this. We started a hiking group and I said, oh, maybe I should start a blog. I didn't know anything about a blog. I didn't even know how a website worked. It was just this big giant disaster of a learning experience for a long time. But then I realized that I wasn't the only one. I realized that there were a lot of people coming to me saying, I've been so afraid to talk about the fact that I'm anxious and I'm depressed and it's so hard going into work and I'm exhausted all the time. But if I tell people I'm tired, I feel like that means that I'm weak. There's something wrong with me and they're going to they're gonna replace me. They're going to hire somebody else. But you're talking about the things that nobody else wants to talk about. So people just, it's just this thing that came out of nowhere. I really didn't intend for this to be a thing. It was just me getting on my soapbox. And I made the joke to a bunch of people that if there were more room on the stage, I literally would have brought my soapbox and started standing on it because I've been screaming about this stuff for years. But the, the conversation is really, really starting to happen, which to me is so exciting that we're here today talking about it. hundreds of us, not just looking at clips, which is great, not just learning about storytelling, but how can we become better storytellers by focusing on this being the operating system and the machine that we really need to optimize, not just the hard drives and not just the computers and not just the NLEs, so to speak. So, well, well said. Uh, you know, the best practices guide that you have there, Andy, um, there's definitely, there are components of it that talk about the working conditions. What about the stuff that Zach talked about? I mean, does it, does it touch on that? Are there avenues there within that best practices guide where you can get into discussions with the people you're working for about, hey, listen, I need, you know, for my own physical wellness and to give you a better, I, th I think one of the things that we need to touch on is this also plays back into the creativity. I mean, the quality of the work will be better if I'm better conditioned, if I'm feeling better, if I'm being able to get out and go for a walk or whatever it is I need to do to not just sit in that chair all day. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what, that, that's really what it's all about. I mean, we're artists, we're storytellers and we're very passionate about what we do. You know, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be, to be able to go into a room every day and create, right? That's why we got into this. Um, and, and my philosophy is that if you're healthy, you know, psychologically healthy, physically healthy, if you feel good about yourself, um, and about your, your working conditions and your, and your life, you're going to do better work, right? You're going to bring more energy. You're going to be more relaxed. You're going to be open to things. You're going to be more spontaneous. And, and that's really what it takes to thrive as an artist, right? And so, yes, I mean, it, so in short, yes, the, the Best Practices book does touch on 
things like ergonomics, you know, the fact that you should, you know, in the last, say, five years, you know, more editors have been standing, right? You have, we have these sit-stand desks now that, that are, are becoming standard within the industry, but some productions don't want to pay for them or some studios say, nah, we, you know, these are the tables we have. They're sit-only they're, they're sit tables, you know, things like that. Um, there's other things like being able to open a window or even have a window, you know, let, let sunlight into your, into your bay, you know. I mean, it's, it's scientifically, medically proven that, you know, if you're de- deprived of sunlight, you know, uh, you can get depressed, right? And that's not good for creativity. So um, it's really about, you know, taking a stand on issues where, you know, when I got into this, I thought, wow, it's amazing. There's a union for editors, you know. There's someone out there that's doing collective bargaining that's, you know, looking out for our best interests in terms of wages, in terms of our hours, that's providing, you know, a foundation for us to build our careers on. But what they don't touch on and what the union doesn't fight for are things like working conditions. And so, you know, coming up in this industry, you know, I started as an AE and, you know, sort of sort of worked my way up and, and worked in a lot of crazy <laughs> environments, you know, um, at studios where, you know, on the, the, the ground floor of the editorial building was the fiberglass manufacturing plant where they would turn it on at, you know, 9, 10 p.m., and you'd be in there sinking dailies, and the fumes would be coming up, you know, and you'd start to feel lightheaded. Or, you know, you work in uh, the former stables, right? You work at a studio where the editorial building used to be the stables for uh, where, where they kept the horses uh, for the Westerns, right? And there's no windows in there at all. Um, and and you can work in these places for years, and, you, and, and this was, these are things that are accepted, you know, like, and 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 a, and a lot of these things happened for very practical reasons, you know. Like when when film started being shot, you know, you needed a dim environment. You know, if you're looking at something on an upright moviola with a 30 watt bulb, you know, you can't have a big window behind. You're not going to be able to see the screen, right? But these things then sort of stayed the status quo for a long time for for you know for editors. Well, that's where the editors go. They go in that building over there, and. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, there was a, I'm 6'9", right? So there's a building I worked on where the ceilings were like six foot. <laughs> you know, that doesn't work. So, um, you know, it's just, you know, like there's an, so what this booklet is, it's, it's not the minimum of what editors need to thrive. It's sort of the ideal, right? Like I think it was, it's important that we say, what, are, what would be the ideal conditions? You know, how would we really like it to be? And it's very hard when you go into a job, you know, as a single person, they're setting up a post-production department to lay down your list of demands to say, you know, we should have a kitchen. We should have a bathroom. You know, we should have maybe a, a communal room where we can all eat lunch together and talk about our episodes. You know, the things that these guys were talking about earlier, you know, it's that there's a culture on every show. And the hope is that when you're working with other writers and other assistants, or, you know, in a multi, you know, editor, multi-assistant environment, that you're all sharing ideas, talking about the shows, talking about your lives, you know, have, have a forum to do that. A lot of, a lot of post-production, post-production departments don't, that doesn't happen because there's no forum, there's no place for it to happen, you know. Um, so these are all things that we talk about in this book. And the idea of forming the committee and having Ace kind of put this together is that when you go in, you can say, well, it's not just what I want, but it's what ACE, what American Cement Editors says is the ideal for us to do our best work, you know. And that the hope is that the more editors that ask for these types of things with the backing of ACE, that eventually some of these things will become institutionalized, you know. Maybe some of these studios will say, well, maybe we should raise the ceilings a little bit, you know, in that building. <laughs> uh, or whatever it is, because they realize, you know, it's it's time, time is ch- you know, changing, you know, like technology, look at the pace of technology, right? It's, it's accelerated so fast, the camera technology, the editing technology that's now available to us. And yet a lot of these environments are staying the same or getting worse, you know, or the hours are getting longer, you know, we're still fighting turnaround, we're still fighting for things um, that should have changed a long time ago, so. So, I guess for Lillian and Carol, where does the friction come from? Where is the resistance when you're trying to raise these issues about working conditions, about diversity, about inclusivity, about health? What is, who's arguing and what is the argument that they're making? Well, I don't argue. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I say that, you know, it's funny, but it isn't. I, can't, I grew up in a neighborhood where if you got in an argument, you could get killed. So 
that's probably too much information. But I actually had a director who, uh, a while back, and I said it to her, and I realized that that was indeed my nature, that she loved to fight. She loved to argue. Her family must have been that way. And it's the only director I've ever turned my back on. And I said, oh, uh, you're not going to change anything. Uh, I said, so I'm going to go back and do it exactly the way you want it. I'm done. I said, I don't argue. And I turned my back like the cats turn their backs on you when they're done with you and they don't want to talk to you. <laughs> and I just went to my avid and I kept working. And that, that show was one of the best shows I've ever done. But it wasn't because that was a kind, um, decent um, director. I had a kind, decent executive producer, assistant, everybody around me, but that director was not a nice person. Um, I do think that um, uh, there's probably other people can bring these things forward about um, a certain kinds of changes. Uh, being um, a woman, people are always, there are many, many people who will look at you like you can't do the work, who will judge you differently. Uh, you just have to, I believe, concentrate on the work um, and encourage people as you are coming up, because people encourage me. I saw one African-American female editor uh, when I started, and uh, she was, to my knowledge, the on the East Coast, the only one. Um, one of my uh, other mentors, she was not a mentor, my, one of my other mentors, uh, John Carter, passed away this week. Uh, he was the first African-American member of ACE. Uh, the second person of color, John So, was the first uh, Korean-American. Um, he was the first African-American editor hired in uh, New York City. Um, so you learn from those people. You learn from all the other people that you work with, either what you will do or what you won't do. And um, sometimes it's behavioral, what you will not put up with. And sometimes you have to quit, which is not the best solution. The union does does protect you uh, in union situations, but I worked, although I've been in the union for 40 years, I worked in many situations that were non-union primarily because they were documentaries. Um, people are people, and they're good ones and they're bad ones, and, um, and you don't realize who you help by being a decent person. Um, in that workplace, you may be the only decent person that assistant knows, and then that assistant hopefully will pass it on when he or she becomes an editor. But... I think as long as you um, encourage people, um, and that's part of what the um, diversity and editing mentoring committee uh, is doing, is you encourage people as they're coming up, you help them connect with each other, connect with job possibilities. Um, the first person who got me a job was a white woman, and it was a woman. And I think that was the area of commonality. Um, so you don't know who's going to help you. And it could be anybody. The person who helped me the most as a director was an African-American woman and then a white man, one, two, and a key critical point in my career. Uh, but uh, you have a moral center. Um, everybody here has a moral center. And I think that is the hardest thing to protect uh, along the road. Uh, it will be challenged from the time you are 25. And uh, if you can keep that together, <laughs> you will perhaps intuit the best jobs for you. And, and if they're not right for you, and I say this not having always been um, done what I say you should do, if it's bad, leave, because there will be something else. There, Every job I've stayed in where it was difficult, um, I paid a price. And uh, you don't get the time back. I told a young editor uh, where I'm working now, I said, you never get the time back. You think you do. You never get it back. And um, 
Uh, but there have been many joyous times, too. And I can tell you what, you know, I could go through a list of 15 things right off the top of my head of assistants who helped me, directors who helped me. Um, I had a director who would bring flowers, one in 40 years. She would bring flowers to editorial. <laughs> Is it time to get that in the guide, Andy? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, and, and, and that worked for me. I mean, I, um, an assistant who is now a member of ACE, we were working together on this film in 91, and she said, oh, I re and we saw each other recently, she said, oh, I remember so-and-so. She used to bring us flowers, and she was telling another producer, and I know that producer who had, she had worked with had never brought her flowers. <laughs> And it was another woman, you know, it just didn't occur to her. And it's a style thing, too. If somebody's style is not your style, um, try to learn when they are actually complimenting you. Um, because sometimes something that's so low-key to you doesn't seem to be a compliment, but in fact is all they're able to do. Um, it, because of their own personality. You know, you might be an effusive person or you might need that, but or they, they, they don't think you need to be encouraged. Um, so, but I, um, I think I can't, um, I, I've accepted that I can't change people. I, I've accepted that. And I, you can work toward change, but there's no guarantee that if I speak to you, unless it's against the law, against actual legal stuff in the organization, or if it's against some kind of moral law you have in yourself, then I don't go there um, because it's, um, well, you do get fired, unless I'm willing to be fired, and I have been fired for going to the, to the mat. I mean, I'll say that. I've gone to the mat, and I was fired. <laughs> and, it's, and I wasn't sorry I went to the mat. I wasn't sorry. Well, that's, that's a reality of the business, that at some point everyone will be fired or be coming onto a job where somebody was just fired. Uh, Carol, how delicate is that? And how do you, I mean, that's, in a career, creative environment like this, that can be a tremendous blow to your ego. How do you manage situations like that, whether you're the one let go or you're the one going onto a job? I'm not sure that I, is the sound on? Okay. Uh, oh, yes, I've been fired. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And it's, it's very uncomfortable. I think plenty of us have been in that position. And I've also replaced editors, which is in a way equally as uh, difficult. And I would just have to say that I, I think Lillian hit it right on the head. You really have to be true to yourself and have courage. Because if you don't, you're always going to be boxed around. Um, and I think the important thing is for us to keep ourselves centered to really know what we what we want out of the project and what we want to convey in the film that we're doing and if you don't feel comfortable doing that you should quit i know none of us want to do that because we'll think well this will you know it won't they won't look kindly upon us but um along this whole conundrum of being fired and 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 also replacing people I think the most important thing, and I started doing this several years ago, many years ago, when I would be called to do either a doctor job or actually knowing I was going to be replacing someone, I would ask the producer, have you told the editor you're going to replace them? Because I do not want to walk into a cutting room and I'm the one telling the editor, oh, I'm here to work. I didn't know there was an editor. They didn't tell you you were going to be replaced by me. So I make that rule number one when I am replacing someone. So I want that person to know, and I want them to have the option of staying on with me because I think that's the fair thing to do. They know the project. They know all the difficulties. I have great faith in editors. I, I know how difficult it is. Obviously, we do. Uh, so that's that's my own rule of thumb. And if I know that I'm going to be, if, if I, if someone is coming in to replace me, I would hope that they would return the favor. Let's put it that way. Um, I've walked in cutting rooms a couple of times and, hmm, who are you? <laughs> oh, I'm here. They didn't tell you? Uh, I'm here to replace you. Very bad situation. Um, and I know when you're fired, you are crushed. 
I mean, I would admit it. It's very, very, very difficult to get over that. And I think one of the things that's very, very healthy is that if you can talk, if you have a coterie of friends who are editors, that you can actually talk to about this. Because if something kind of grows in the dark, um, quite apart from the fact that we are working in the dark, um, it can become very polluting for your mind. It can really kind of destroy you from within. That is just simply not a healthy thing to do. I don't know if I answered your question, but um, I think sometimes we have to go to this sort of heart of darkness and really talk about it. Um, many projects that I have been on, I know within the first two or three days I've made a mistake. This is not the project for me. And I, earned, I learned very, very early on that if, I, if my gut tells me that this is something I shouldn't do, I want to listen to it. That's your, I think that's the best measure is to really be truthful with yourself. And I just don't take on a project that I know I, I simply couldn't do for all kinds of reasons, like you say, whether it be personalities or the script itself or anything in between. I, I just don't go there. Well, if you don't mind, one thing to, to add to that, um, and actually to ask a question to the audience. I know that uh, in the beginning he polled how many were assistants, how many were editors and whatnot. How many of you are here just because you're like, eh, I guess editing, I guess it'll pay the bills. I'm not passionate about it, but it's a job. How many of you here are in that camp? Oh. Nobody. Everybody is here because they're like, this is so cool. I get to tell stories and I get to make people feel stuff and I get to put all these pieces together. If you're working in a job where you're miserable and people are treating you with disrespect, you are allowing them to take that passion from you. They don't have the right to do that. You own that passion. That's something you've had your whole life. And if people are disrespecting you or it's a matter of, you know, diversity issues, whether it's your gender, whether it's your color, whether it's just the fact that you don't, you know, you're not respected in the editor room because of your creative choices. If you're staying there, not only does it just kind of stink, but, oh, I need the paycheck. You're slowly letting these people erode that passion from you. And I don't think you should ever allow people to take that away from you. And that's something I need that that think that everybody here needs to protect, like you protect, you know, everything you own in the world, because that's what's going to get you the success that you want in this industry. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so building on that, you know, not just in, in this industry, but in a lot of businesses, um, there is a notion of paying your dues and of rite of passage. And does that just get, that concept get, uh, abused in terms of like, okay, well, you know, you deserve to be treated like this. I, I was treated like this when I was starting out. Is that sort of a cycle of unhealthiness that just keeps perpetuating or, you know, because if I'm just starting out and I want to be where you are someday, I might be willing to put up with that. And, and how do I deal with that situation? I, I'd like to take that one. <laughs> um. I, I read uh, recently that, uh, you know, it was a medical review um, that 80% um, your gut reaction um, is accurate 80% of the time. So it, the old adage, if it feels wrong, it is wrong, um, is uh, true scientifically. Uh, I also believe that sometimes we accept things that people say uh, or behaviors because it's familiar to us. And sometimes we get hired because they perceive that our um, maladjustment will coincide with their behavior. And sometimes they're just not nice people. I've worked for not nice people. Um, I've worked for people who were just kind and thoughtful and intelligent uh, and uh, worked you very, very hard, uh, but were uh, decent human beings. And I think it's more than just, um, I think it's, it's a question of character uh, a, a lot of the time. Um, this person who, as an example, uh, gave flowers to her, uh, who her editors also told me that I had no idea how good I was. She's the first person who ever said that to me. She said, you really have no idea. And, you know, I didn't. Why? Because nobody had told me. 
And I don't come from a family where this was common knowledge or where anybody was an artist. I went to art school, and some of that was subjective. You know, how did you paint? Somebody would like it. A teacher didn't like you, they'd give you a C. Teacher liked you, they'd give you an A. It's no different than here, but um, you know what you'll accept. And what another person will accept, you don't have to accept. And also some people will treat you differently than they treat another person. And I've seen it, and... That's their prerogative. If it's not against the law and it's not against your moral center, you really can't do too much about it except I, I'm not going to work 16 hours without getting paid overtime or I'm always going to take my lunch or I have to have an assistant or if the second person on the three-person team leaves, I do get the second room because it's bigger because that's the way it's done, that's seniority. There are those things that are in place in the workplace, and perhaps I don't, I haven't worked in any other business except teaching, so I don't know whether the corporate world is that, you know, um, fluctuating and it's not based on rules. I don't know any other business. Uh, but there are some people who are just abusive. And there's some people who are just nice and everybody wants to do the job and we're all artists here or we want to be artists <clears throat> and we're not always, and sometimes they don't want that. Sometimes they don't want the artist. That's the hard thing to accept. I mean, I don't know what your experience has been with that. They don't want the person you are mm -hmm. and then you find somebody else. Well, uh, to, to piggyback on this whole paying your dues thing, um, yeah, you got to pay your dues. You got to work really, really hard and you have to put yourself in uncomfortable situations, but you have to ask yourself the question, am I learning and growing while I'm doing this or am I just slowly being disrespected and treated poorly and am I miserable and is it stressing me out? Like to get to the place where you're successful in any industry, not just this one, you've got to be incredibly uncomfortable for a long time, but it needs to be uncomfortable because you're getting stronger and you're growing and you're getting smarter and you're getting better. If you're not doing any of those things, and it is like they've been talking about where you're just being disrespected, that's not paying your dues. That, And unfortunately, that's kind of that, well, this is just the way that it is, and I know this is how people get treated, and <laughs> it's, it's just all part of it. This is what it takes. It's not what it takes. It's what you're allowing people to do, but if you're in a position where you are learning and growing and you're working really long hours and you're really tired, but people are respecting you and allowing you to grow... Yes, that's a great place to be, but it's still really, really hard. But that's the right way to do it. So there's a difference between paying your dues and just being treated miserably because you can be because you're still learning how to you know, grow up in the industry. So those people that are difficult to work with or more importantly work for, um, is, there a, is there a line of thinking that conflict and pressure breeds creativity, that they're getting the best work out of you by putting you in a situation like that? Do you, do you feel that you run into that? Um, whether it's that director you work with, they're just sort of inclined to fight. Well, it's their mythology. Excuse me. It's their mythology. It's their worldview. I've, you know, I've come to see it that way. I didn't see it that way when I was 35. Um, they see the world differently than you. And, and sometimes that difference includes uh, a hierarchy that you cannot be a part of um, or refuse to be a part of, um, as I did with that woman. Sometimes their um, uh, mythology includes the fact that um, uh, you don't want a smart person with, around you or you don't want a smart woman in the room. Um, or, and there are shops that have never, uh, when I was coming up, that never hired women, just never. ABC Sports was one of those places and also... Um, um, I think it's Bud Schulberg, who used to do all the Olympic films, never hired a female editor, never hired a female assistant, ever. Um, so that's what he wanted. Um, one of my colleagues won one of the first uh, Emmys for uh, short form sports um, in probably like 1980. She was one of the first ones, a woman. So women can cut sports. 
Uh, but that was this guy's thinking. So that's a worldview that I may, I, I don't have to accept, but that's his business. And he can do that unless it's against the law. And there was a lawsuit at ABC Sports and they had to hire a woman. Um, so I think it's, well, I guess that's what I come back to is um, everybody has to work hard. I would, and I would equate paying your dues with working hard. But some people are abusive. But something that, <clears throat> Zach, you said earlier about um, self-preservation, um, I think uh, self-preservation, some people think something that you call self-preservation, they call weakness. And they call you out for not sleeping uh, eight hours. So they say, oh, I can get on with four. And what do the uh, doctors say? That you need seven to eight hours. So if a job is making you work six hours, uh, sleep six hours regularly, that is not good. That is not what this organism needs. And we won't even talk about us being creative. But how many people, you know, or I, you know, you get in a car accident because you're too tired. Uh, somebody posted something on Facebook. She was working on a pilot 16 hours a day for seven, eight days straight, and she had a car accident. Not a bad one, but she had an accident. And she said she knew it was a result of that. That is what I think everybody here is saying not to do. Uh, if somebody says something offensive in front of you, you've got to negotiate how you handle that. If someone says something uh, offensive on a panel, you have to figure out how you negotiate that. If you're um, a moderator, do you say something? Uh, if you are the assistant and your executive says something, what do you say? What can you say? Knowing always that you can be fired. Because they can fire you and say anything. Oh, she's too slow, or oh, she, uh, or someone can sabotage you. Um, uh, so um, I, I think it's it. Maybe that's too, you know, ethereal that it is a worldview. Um, some people um, just are, are, have a different different value system than you have. But you know what you can stand, and you know what's good for you. And, and you know how you work best. So try to tell the person that. I, I mean, I knock on my assistant's door. I don't have to knock on his door. But, but I want to treat him uh, and well, and I don't want him to be surprised, so I knock, knock. And then I just walk in, I don't wait, and his door is open. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm, you know, I'm coming in to tell him something, but I want to warn him, you know, because you're in your, this this other world when you're at that machine. You're not, you know, you you got to come back from it, even as an assistant. I don't know. He and we're working a three-two, so three editors, two assistants. It's not my assistant. It's my assistant on that episode, and and then I have an assistant on the other episodes. Um, and they and they're always working on somebody else's show when when I walk in, but I don't barge into the to their rooms um, because I, that's my value. Other people do what they want, you know. Well, as editors, are you having these brutally frank conversations with one another, or is that veneer of competition? Because I hear that a lot. I'm in competition with this other editor. Is that a barrier to having these discussions? I mean, wh why why? Why do we have to have a forum like this and talk about this? I address that. I think we all, we, oddly enough, we work kind of in isolation uh, these days. We no longer are in a studio structure where we had long hallways and people were constantly seeing each other. I know, at least I have in the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, have worked either in the producer's house, the director's house, or in a room kind of off someplace hidden. So we don't actually work with each other. I work with other editors on and off and with other assistants, but I don't work with a lot of editors. And there aren't many places where we can actually be this truthful and try to explore, on one hand, what Andy is talking about, or just our basic working conditions, 
or what Lillian is talking about, which is our own measure of, of uh, individual courage vis-a-vis -vis our jobs and in a way an extension into our lives. And I'm, I'm hoping that ACE provides that when we all get together. It's like this crazy wall that's going on and everybody's so buzzing about their their work and each other and what are you doing? And and then it gets into the grousing level of, oh, I can't stand it anymore. And blah, blah, blah. But then you get past the grousing level and you sort of come to a place where you can actually talk about the basic issues, which, which Lillian and, and Zach and Andy are talking about, is that how do we actually integrate this great job into our lives and not have it crush us. And each person has to kind of navigate those waters. <clears throat> and I find it very supportive to be around fellow editors like today and actually break that wall down and talk about it. I don't feel that editing is this um, dog eat dog sort of, I mean, I, I don't think I could work two seconds and in, in that world. I, I don't feel that way at all. I feel like I'm making something, I'm a part of a process, of a creative process, of, of an exploration. There's so much about editing that, that I find to be so fortifying in my life that I, that's what's important. Um, and I think that's why we all wanted to participate in this panel, was to somehow open that door and, and shed some light on each other's experience, uh, the joyful part of it as well as the part, uh, we, the grousing part. <laughs> We're yeah. all very good grousers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my, my experience is I work in episodic television mostly where there's teams of editors. And um, I find that from show to show, you know, the culture can be different. Um, if I start season one on a show, I can be instrumental in sort of establishing what kind of culture, or what the kind of collegiality or the you know, how we all get along and how we communicate. Um, there's been series that I go on to where I'm coming in on a second season and there's a culture that's already established that can be not great, <laughs> you know, where editors don't talk, they don't have lunch together, they stay in their room, there is a sense of competition and all that kind of stuff. And it's very hard to break that, you know. Um, that's just the truth. But I think it's it's being cognizant of that and and trying to promote the kind of culture that you want to have on that on a show when you go on to it and and from day one, you know, um, because you can establish that kind of culture. And I think people, you know, I've seen assistants that come up through a doggy dog kind of studio system where they're all c competing to try to get a seat, you know, to be the next editor. And they carry that on to the next series, you know, because that's the way they came up and that's, you know, they, it's the, it becomes the way they think they have to operate professionally, you know, and that's unfortunate. So, um, you know, we can all decide what, how we want the culture to be and, um, you know, and, and that's part of what, why it's important to have these discussions, you know, to, to say, you know, this is the way it should be and we should be supportive of each other and, and we should be having these dialogues and we should be going to other editors if, we, if, if you're feeling, uh, a, you know, that you're in an abusive situation or something transpired at work that made you really uncomfortable, you can go to your fellow editors and say, what do I do? How, how should we approach this? You know, it's really important. Um, one, one other thing about quitting. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have quit, a, a, not many, but I have quit a job. It's really important to do it gracefully. I've seen situations and been, been on shows where people were, were fired or where people quit and they flamed out. And that's, you know, they sent email to everybody on the production <laughs> and uh, you regretted it. So don't do that. That's not a good <laughs> idea. Um, because, you know, it, it's a very small community, you know, and word gets around. So there's really, you know, you're, it's perfectly fine to leave a situation that you're not feeling, where you're not feeling creatively fulfilled or you're not feeling respected or whatever. Do it in, in a graceful way, you know, and that's all. Could I add one tiny thing? Absolutely. Along, sorry, I'm stacked. No, go ahead. Um, I think there's an element here that no, none of us really want to talk about also, and I, it's, a, it's called fear. Um, I would be the first to admit that when I start a show, I think, I can't do this. <laughs> there's no way I can actually do this job. Um, it's like starting over each time. I feel like I'm in kindergarten when I start. <laughs> And I, I think probably all of us have a little edge of fear. It's probably a good thing. 
because we have to really try to do better. But I, I think fear is also can get in the way. And the way you work around that, I think, is really important. Very, very important. And I keep telling myself, I don't have to do it all at once. I have every day to do this. And I was talking to Zach a couple of years ago, and we were talking about one of the biggest components in kind of battling this, this fear, this element of can I do it, can I do it, I don't know if I can do it, is to stay healthy, mind and body. Very, very important. Now, I'm not a very good example today because I tore a tendon in my foot, so I, you should see the other guy. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think, um, I think fear is something we should talk about. It's, it's, it can really eat away at you. Well, and I think that the, one of the biggest fears that people have when it comes to the health, the mind, the body, the environment, whatever it is, is that I'm going to be replaced. Somebody else is going to come in because there are thousands of people that want the job that I got. And if I don't push myself beyond my limits and do whatever it takes to deliver this product, I'm going to get fired and I'm going to drop like a fly and they're just going to replace me and they're going to get more flies. And what you realize, like you were talking about with these people that just flame out and, you know, get fired or, you know, they quit, whatever it is, and they're burning the bridges. There are like 14 people in this whole industry. It is this tiny and it, the, the deep deeper you get into it, the more you realize I'm meeting the same people at every job. We all know the same people. We all have the same friends. So if you're at one of these jobs where you just said, you know, I've had enough and I can't take it. And by the way, I have very publicly had one of those. Um, it was called Empire. I was on the first two seasons of it and it was fantastic creatively. But then I realized this is not a work environment that's conducive to me being a good father and a good husband. It is a job environment that is taking everything from me. And I was driving two to three hours a day and I decided this is, is not the lifestyle that I want right now, having two young kids and really putting my family as one of my priorities. So I said, you know what? This is something I'm going to have to leave. And I didn't leave at the best time of the season, but I was very conscious of how I left. I was very respectful. I gave them enough time to replace me, even though in my head, like I was just that little character in a Bugs Bunny cartoon that goes through the door. Whoosh, <laughs> and there's like the, the, the smoke trail. That was my head. I was just, I was out the door, but I said, no, this is a really small business. I might work for these people again, but there was a huge part of me right here. That's like, I've never left a show. And this is such a huge opportunity. Like how stupid am I going to be to leave this? And they're just going to replace me and I'm never going to get hired again. And I think that that fear is what drives us to always put the career first and always put the work first before we put our health. But um, like, you know, you had said that you don't get the time back. You never get it. And your time is your most important investment. So I think that fear is a huge driver of why we make so many of these bad decisions to our own detriment. As Carol said, there's a big element of working in isolation as an editor, but you also often work with another editor, you know, on the same projects, same show, same scene. Um, and I've heard about editors, editors being put in situations where the directors are almost having them compete with one another. Uh, we talked about uh, you know, having conversations with other editors when you're coming on as the one that's replacing them or, or you're being let go. What sort of negotiations, and maybe that's not a great word, uh, but sort of dialogue happens between editors that are sharing a project? Because that can be, maybe you have different worldviews, maybe you have different personalities, working styles, different ambitions. That can be delicate as well. How do you deal with that? Well, I mean, you know, first of all, know the situation that you're getting into and whether you want to get into it. I mean, recently, um, <laughs> my agents called me and there's a notorious director who's, you know, often hires like six editors and has them all working on the same scene. And I'm not going to name who it is, but some of you may know who it is. But, um, and they said, hey, you know, they're looking for an editor. And I was like, no, thank you. I don't want to do that. You know, because I just, I don't think it's respectful to the editors. I don't think it's a good environment. So, you know, you you know, you can you know nip it in the bud. You you don't have to take those jobs if you know that you know you can talk to other editors that are working on on those shows or have worked for that director or those showrunners and and kind of find out what what the environment's going to be like beforehand and decide whether you even want to take it. But I think um, on the shows that you do go on to, inevitably, if you're working in episodic television or something like that, you're going to be working with other editors. And I think you have to just, like, a, it goes back to the culture. It goes back to having a dialogue, establishing a trust with your other editors. You know, a big thing, you know, that I talk to other editors about is establishing trust 
with directors and showrunners. You know, how do you earn their creative trust? You know, how do they, you know, they're coming, they're trusting you to, to, to deliver the story, to make it happen, you know? And, and why should they trust you? You know, like, well, maybe you've been doing it a long time. You know, maybe you've, you know, won an award, maybe, but still you have to earn their trust. You have to prove to them that you can do it. Um, but I think equally as important is to earn the trust of, of your other editors, you know, to let them know that you're not going to go behind their back, that you've, that you've got their back, you know, even if you're collaborating, collaborating on the same episode that, you know, you're going to be respectful of their work and you're going to have a dialogue with them. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, that's what it takes. You know, it's like all those communication skills, um, you know, it's not just about being a good editor. It's about how you communicate, how you present yourself, about how respectful you are of other people. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, inside all of us, there's insecurity, right? I mean, that's what Carol was talking about. You go into a job, you're like, can I do it? You know, uh, what, how, is, how is this person going to feel if I talk to them about their episode? Or, you know, how am I going to receive the information? You know, it's like the criticism that I, that I get from other editors or from other people. And um, it's about how you manage that insecurity. And I think the stress comes from, you know, the, the sort of fight or flight <laughs> response, you know, because a lot of times, you know, you're in a situation where you're being, you know, it's like, it's really hard or it feels untenable. And then it's like, well, I can't fight, you know, I can't like really fight back against the director or the producer or what I'm being asked to do. And I don't want to flee. Like, I don't want to run and like quit, you know, because I need a job and because, I like what I'm doing. So, and that's where you get stressed because you can't, you know, flee or fight, right? And then you're like, and that stress, you know, can build up, you know, chemicals in the body and can have detrimental effects on your, on your brain, on your physiology. So, you know, it's, it's, it's learning how to deal with that. It's, it's really hard. I mean, one of the things that I do just as, you know, every day I get up and have, I, set my alarm clock early and I get up and I go for a walk, you know, I never used to do that. Um, you know, I, I grew up in New York and, you know, you know, in LA, you know, you get up, you grab a cup of coffee, you get in your car, you drive to work, you sit, you go, out, you know, you drive back, you know, there are certain environments where, you know, you know, naturally as part of your day, you get to walk and think and clear your head and LA doesn't necessarily lend itself to that. So I encourage everybody like at lunch, get up, you know, get out of the editing room, get out on the street, go for a walk. Or if you're in a studio lot, go for a walk. You know, it can do wonders just to like reduce the amount of <laughs> stress and toxicity in your body. Um, you know, it's just like, man, how, you know, you understand that you're a machine. You have to manage all these things. You know, it's, mm -hmm. you know. I, I worked for one director who would, um, even if we had lunch in, he'd say, you have to go out and get your 15 minutes of sun. And he would banish me from the cutting room to stand. He said, go for a walk, or if not, stand in the sun. And, and he was every day. And he was um, a, used to be a very hard-driving editor, uh, director, uh, who then had a heart attack. And he said, um, not on my watch, not on my watch. Get up, get up, get up. And he would chew you like you were a chicken, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> And I'd have, and one day it was like ninety something outside, and I didn't want to go walk. <laughs> <laughs> but I stood outside of the premises for fifteen minutes, looked at my watch. Okay, 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 okay. Emery will let me come back in now. And then, uh, but it was um, for my health. And you know, subsequently, like in the last couple of years, I developed a vitamin D deficiency, which meant I was not getting enough sun. So I had to take medication for, you know, extra vitamin D for uh, a month or two months, and then I'm done. But I try to get out in the sun now. Um, but that director was right. <clears throat> and I don't always follow his um, uh, directive, but um, he was right and he was taking care of me so he could get the best work out of me. And that that show is still one of the best things I've ever done. And one of my favorites uh, uh, was about people who were 100 years old. And for HBO, it was just wonderful. And of course, here we are sitting watching all these people and knowing that, you know, we should live so long, you know. Uh, but he made sure we did that. Zach um, will talk about this more and has more experience with it than I do. But I, 
always, um, my assistants know that I love to take them on a forced walk. <laughs> and uh, when in the day when we used to be on location, um, a couple of times uh, I was in um, situations where we were very close to nature walks and all of that. So we would, I'd make them get up an hour early and we would, for instance, but um, well, this is one of the nature walk, but we were working in St. Louis and I would tell my crew, okay, we're getting up, uh, we're going to walk from 7 to 8 o'clock. We're going to go down to the arch and back in St. Louis. They looked at me like, what? <laughs> this is going to kill me. No. We started doing that every day because I would, I would do it every day. I do what Andy does. I get up and I go for a walk before work and I take a long walk at lunch. And many times I'll do something in the evening as well because you're sitting there forever and you're absolutely stunting your brain. You know, the, the flow and the oxygen is just not moving around. And keeping a clear head is one of the most important things we can do when we're working. I never take lunch in my cutting room. I don't have snacks in my cutting room. It's coffee or water, no soft drinks. I mean, I just, at a certain point, I realized all that stuff was really poisoning me. No more. Zach has a whole program that deals with this. Yeah, I might have a resource or two about this topic available. Um, so the the really, really short spiel that I can give and the lesson that I've learned is when I first started this, um, and many of you may know this, it was called Fitness in Post because it's like, we don't fix it in post, we fitness in post. And editors were like, oh, don't say the word fitness, I'm scared. Like, <laughs> they didn't like the idea of physical fitness. And I realized that if you're talking to them about these are the detriments of being sedentary and sitting is killing you and it's, you know, giving you an it ridiculously increased rate of kidney disease and heart disease and breast cancer for women and, you know, all these horrible things. They're like, yeah, but that's like 30 years down the road, man. I just got to get through this week. I just have to survive until Friday, right? And I'm like, oh my God, this is absurd. But then where I really realized that people started to listen is what these guys are talking about. You can affect your level of creativity immediately by moving. So how many people here have had a brilliant idea, life-changing creative thought while you were sitting staring at a computer monitor six inches from your face? <laughs> Nobody. How many of you have had a great idea while you were in the shower? <laughs> right? How many of you have had a great idea while you were on a break taking a walk? It's because you're putting your brain into what's called the default mode, where you don't have all of this constant stimulus. You don't have Facebook. You don't have your news feed in front of you. You're not actively thinking about how to solve a problem. Your brain starts to drift. That's where creativity happens. That's not my opinion. That's based on brain maps and science. Creativity happens when your brain is allowed to relax and take different disparate ideas that don't belong together and you bring those ideas together. Thinking is something that happens in that default mode and the way to activate what's called the thinking brain is to move. The thinking brain cannot be activated if your body isn't moving. So if you're sitting all day long or even sitting for an hour and they've done scientific tests on this, you burn a little more than a calorie a minute. If you're walking and you're moving around, you can burn hundreds of calories in an hour. So and as anybody that knows my program knows, I love to quantify stuff. So I have put heart rate monitors on me just while I'm, for example, recording a podcast. In a 60-minute podcast, I'll burn 500 calories. That's more than a lot of workouts that you can do. That's because I want to be creative and I want to be engaged with the people that I'm talking to. When I need to solve a problem in the edit suite, the first thing that I do is I leave. and or Either I'll leave or I will move around. An example would be that, and I'm sure there are probably some people here that can attest to this story, I'll start swinging a kettlebell, I'll start doing jumping jacks, and there was a, an incident on one show <laughs> where I was on a higher level, like we were on the, the third or fourth level, and the floor started to shake. And as I was doing the jumping jacks, I heard people say, oh my God, I think there's an earthquake. Everybody's everybody all right? I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> um, open white guys, um, that was me. I was just doing jumping jacks. I'm like, oh my God. Oh, without an earthquake. But whenever I need to solve a problem, I move. And that doesn't mean that I don't sit. Everybody thinks that I must just stand like a, a rock for 14 hours a day. Standing all day is still being sedentary. You need to move. So I'm constantly changing my position. And if I have a really, really hard creative challenge, what I've done in the past is I will go run the stairs. 
I'm just stuck and I can't think about how to solve this issue. And I think that um, Natalie is here, right? She's one of my former assistants that's now editing. She was here. Yes, yeah, she's over there. She's waving her hands. Um, there was a, a scene that I was working on once. I just could not solve it. And I just disappeared for 15 minutes and I came back drenched in sweat from having run the stairs. I'm down. I'm like, I got it. I know how to fix this problem. And I just went into the edit suite for an hour straight. Shh, done, fixed. But it's not because I just sat there and powered through. It's because I stepped away. So movement is a huge, huge key to being creative, whether or not you care about longevity or your health. But you should care about your longevity and your health, by the way. <laughs> I have heard the shower thing before and people have mental blocks. Um, are there different techniques that you employ when you run into those? I can't figure this scene out. I can't figure a way out, out of this. Um, what are your go-to moves to, to, to fix that problem? Well, um, it, at home, it's either watering the lawn. Uh, it's it's never doing laundry, uh, but it's often washing dishes. Seems to uh, it's the water, and that's from when I was a child. I used to like daydream washing dishes because that, of course, was one of my chores. Um, sometimes getting up and walking, um, I'm on the universal lot, so there's a nice place to walk, um, many options. Uh, sometimes it's just going in and talking to one of the other post people or the assistant um, or going downstairs and watching, like, this sounds crazy, the traffic going in and out of the lot, you know, standing in the sun though, and watch the traffic go in and out and just kind of, it's almost like I always I talk about, I, I used to like to play Scrabble. It's sometimes uh, when you figure out how to use the blank piece and you can make a great word. Um, sometimes the idea is it just comes out of nothingness. And, but it's, it's, I've had one um, that I remember, brilliant idea, at the Avid. Uh, <laughs> and, and I in had... Your whole career, right? In my whole career. And I had... Thanks, Lillian. And the reason I had it... Well, excuse me, at an editing machine. How's that? Um, a little better. Um, it was because I had to get on a plane in... Uh, I had a half an hour left at that job, and that was my last day, and nobody could solve this problem, and it just came to me. Uh, but that was like the gun to the head, and it was in response to uh, one of the executive's um, request that, that it was a scene that we had taken out that he said was very important to his children. And I just thought, how can I, how can we, how can I, how, you know, get this scene back in? And we all loved it, but we couldn't figure it out. And then I figured it out. But I also, knowing the team, downplayed it. And this is about politics in the cutting room, especially the male director who didn't want to hire me. Um, I said, oh, this, this might this might be a crazy idea, but I don't know. So, but I knew it was right. I knew it was the solution. <laughs> Pinocchio. Uh, and so I, I laid it out for them and they said, yes. But that's the only one that I can remember. Otherwise it's been walking and you say, oh yeah. Or you go up the steps to somebody else's office and, and then you know what you have to do or know the process. One was a, a dance sequence I had to cut and I made, uh, I listened to the music all day and, um, while cutting something else and it was drumming. So in another language, so it wasn't anything I could understand. But I knew if I played that music for a couple of hours, I would be able to come in and cut the scene the next day without any trouble. And I, I was able, to, and that was more of a process thing. I, know, I knew myself, I had to get the rhythm in me in order to be able to send it out again. Um, but that's the only other one that's come from an editing situation. <laughs> Matt, can I add to that? Please. I think what Lillian is talking about is really trusting the process. And a lot of times we forget that we do have a process in editing. And uh, we're constantly thinking about a problem rather than just trusting the process. That it'll, If we give it some time, 
allow it to have some air, put a pin in it, come back to it later, we'll have we'll have a solution. Just don't, you know, torture yourself over, I got to solve it, got to solve it now, now, now. Just say, okay, push yourself away from that one, do something else, come back to it. And sometimes your assistant will have the solution. Oh, yeah, I love that. That's true. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Carol. I mean, there's stories of, you know, famous mathematicians who are trying to solve a proof, right? And they can't get it and they've been working on it. And, you know, they go home at night, they sleep on it. And the next morning they wake up with the solution, you know? And I think the same thing happens in editorial. I think sometimes just taking a break, you know, don't put too much pressure on yourself to try to always mm -hmm. solve it that day. Um, there is a thing that I've talked to other editors. There, you know, some number of years ago, the New York Times Magazine uh, section had an article about something called decision fatigue. And basically, you know, scientists looked at the human brain and the human, human psychology um, in people and said, there's a set number of decisions that a, that a human being can make every day. Like every decision, whether it's a small decision, like what I'm going to have for breakfast to like a big decision, um, what am I doing with my life or, or whatever? I'm going to buy that house or that car, or, you know, some other big decision. It all expends the same amount of energy because um, it's a decision, you know, it's a synaptic thing that happens in your brain. And so what we do all day when we're creative is we're making decisions, like thousands of decisions, right? So you can burn through all your decisions by lunch, you know, like if you're doing a lot of editing. Um, and there's really no way to like, get yourself more decisions in a day. You know, you just have to go to sleep for s at least six to eight hours and wake up the next day and have more decisions. So tomorrow is another day. And, and I think that's just to be aware of like how your brain works. You know, I, I, sometimes I'm working late hours and I'm like, you know, it just gets exponentially harder and harder and harder to sort of come up with that idea or that solution. But, you know, you'll get it the next day. So it's hard to hear you talk about the, the lack of physical interactivity and the increase in distractions and sort of not sit here and think about, well, did the rise of the avid in the 90s have a lot to do with those things happening and being somewhat culpable for that? Um, was it different when you're working on Moviola or editing benches or flatbeds? I mean... Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it is, it, it is our fault. You're I'm an old fault. film editor. <laughs> 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 have been, will always be. Uh, there's, there was something wonderful about rewinding the film of having a little rest when you would actually lock the picture and it was locked because you had to hand it over and making a change was really going to take a long time. You had actually a moment to kind of breathe and get a little perspective on the project before you started mixing. I mean, all kinds of things gave us little breathers. And now because we kind of are expected to do everything with the Avid or whatever we're working on. Uh, you have to give yourself some breathing time because no one's going to give it to you. And it's really important. It's very, very important. Um, uh, because there's some people who just think that you wind us up and we're just... <laughs> I remember the first time that I worked on an Avid show, this company had bought a lot of Avids and so they want us to use them. And... I, I felt a little uncomfortable. I said, okay, great. They said, well, it, w I don't think you're going to need an assistant because this machine does everything. <laughs> I said, well, probably does. Then maybe you just need to plug me into the wall. I'll see you later. <laughs> and I said, I, I don't think I can work that way. So they came back to me several days and said, no, 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 we can get you an assistant. We can get you an assistant. I mean, just nutty stuff like that. <laughs> well, I think one thing to, to add to what you're saying, I can't speak really much to the, the film days, but what I can speak to is the pre-social media days. Oh. And I think that one of the detriments to our creativity and our health is our addiction to technology, whether it's, you know, doing this all day long or the, whether it's every time you're taking a walk, you have to be listening to a podcast or you have to be listening to an audio book or you have to be talking to somebody. There's always this need for constant 24-7 stimulus. Yeah. 
and going back to the conversation about the default network for your brain and for accessing creativity, you can't access creativity while you're responding to every single tweet and Snapchat and Facebook IM and you're listening to this news story and you're reading all this sensationalized crap that's going on in the world today. You can't be creative. So you have to create barriers in your creative space to keep that stuff away. Now, I'm not saying Facebook is the devil and it's horrible. Facebook is... But it the is. Well, it, it can be. It can be. <laughs> However, you can harness these things to get the positive things out of them. For example, many of the people in uh, my life and my family are not in Los Angeles. They feel like they're growing up with my kids because I and my wife are very active on social media. But I also have barriers and I have habits in place to make sure that those don't also invade my creativity. So if you're thinking about one of the easiest, quickest takeaways for how can I actually just become more creative, start thinking about your relationship that you have with distractions and with technology because back in the film days, back in the pre-social media days, there was a lot more empty, dead space to just be in a dark room and be creative. And we don't have that anymore unless we create it. You have to make it a priority because we don't have the same environment where you were physically moving and you know your, your, your process of editing was actually something that would move your body and it would move your brain. And nowadays it doesn't do that. So you have to build in the habits and change the environment so it is more conducive to those things. The other thing that I notice more and more is that we are getting clobbered with so much footage. And being an old film editor, I want to look at everything and really think about it. So how can you engineer your sort of life to take care of all this? And I take a lot of notes. I mean, this is just the way that I do it. I take a lot of notes and kind of once again, trust the process in, in kind of the way that I used to do it on film. And uh, I don't really use the avid a way that a lot of people do where they just start cutting. I really think about it and almost have a certain level of pre-visualization in my brain before I start. And it may take a long time to look at everything and my little notes and my notepad. But once I start to actually put it together, it goes to bed really fast. And... Um, it's just the way that I've learned to cope with this extraordinary amount of uh, uh, amount of footage, which, is, which, by the way, is not always very artistic, nor are the uh, performances that great. When I'm working with a director who loves to shoot all the time, all the time, all the time, I say, wouldn't you just like to stop, let everybody reset, give everybody a note, let them think about it, and then do another take? Mm. And believe it or not, that's pretty good advice. <laughs> um, and I've worked with several directors recently who say, oh, yeah, it does work. <laughs> so uh, maybe certain habits that we had in the past are actually still very valuable, and that's one of them. Well, uh, just... Um, I was just going to add an addendum to that real quick, is that there's a big difference between footage and coverage. Big difference between those two words. It's a better take. Yes, exactly. So we're getting a lot more footage. It doesn't mean we're getting a lot more coverage. So I'm just going to throw that out there. I think part of um, it's not, I would maybe not blame the um, technology um, or the editing machines because I assisted on much smaller scale projects in film, 16 and 35. But the way, if you watch, um, you, you may not be addicted to older television programming, but when you watch older shows that you liked when you were a kid, they were shot so differently than now oh, yeah. um, because they were edited on film. Um, you'll have a, you know, a two shot that a, a side view that goes on for a lo longer without a cut than anything that would be acceptable in any cutting room I work on at, at, in, in now. And so I think that's part of what Zach is saying is that the material is, is sometimes just a, a not thought through. It's because the schedules are different, the expectations are different, the uh, audience is different. Mm -hmm. The audience will not accept, um, or, or sometimes the executive will not accept um, a longer shot. Even in a, a documentary, I, uh, documentary editor, a director I worked with, he 
and he's done he's got so many Emmys and so many awards and he actually admitted he said you know I have uh, a, a attention deficit disorder I you got to cut and I and I said oh okay and so I understood that for him a, a an interview that went on a long time or a piece of stock footage that didn't cut away and cut away and cut away or the side angle was boring to him. It wasn't the content. He was actually physically uncomfortable. Now, he was brave enough to tell me that, but he was, he was a little, he said it in an irritated way so that he would know, that I would know not to cut that way for him because it was way too cutty for me. And this was a historical documentary. This was not, um, you know, um, a, a, a race or, a, you know, a car chase. It was not that. So the amount of footage, the different styles of, cut, of, of, of editing, the different styles people are used to and will accept all come into that big pipeline that, you know, can knock, uh, knock us over when we get in the cutting room. It's like, what are they shooting? How many pains, you know? <clears throat> you know, when they set up the app and all these pains and, and, and we, uh, we shoot uh, three camera mostly uh, on the show that I'm on now, uh, Chicago Men. I've never worked on a three camera show and we sh- they shoot three cameras all the time. Um, I think maybe 20% of the time it's two. Um, is it necessary? I'm not the director. I know. <laughs> two, two, angles are, two of those angles are compromised. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, even though they're all very approachable people, I think it'd be a mistake not to um, give you a chance to ask them questions right now. And certainly you could go up to them later on and talk to them. But uh, Jenny is here somewhere. Jenny, where are you? I can't see a thing up here, no, so you're going to have to help. Jenny. Okay. Well, anybody got any questions? There we go. All right, so Jenny has the microphone, but you can have mine, too. All right, and he's going <laughs> to... Yeah, he didn't even have to stand up to do that. <laughs> um, so what I'm wondering is, in a lot of offices, you can have people with special health problems. Like, in my office, we have people with endometriosis, diabetes chronic migraines, and that can cause like sudden unexpected little mini emergencies, which can kind of mess with time management. And it can also be an issue when you're being hired in the first place. Like, when do you bring this up with your employer? Because at some point, in some way, it's going to come up. And I'm wondering if you guys had any thoughts or advice on how to deal with that from either the perspective excuse me, the perspective of someone like up and coming that's dealing with those issues or someone that is um, just kind of hiring for, you know, and having to look out for prospective employees with issues like that. Um, I'm just wondering how you've thought of dealing with that so far. Um, I mean, the, the first thing that I'll say kind of above and beyond any specific kind of time management issue or health issue or whatever, like we are people first, right? So whatever disability or issue it is that you may have, that always takes priority to a certain extent as your health should. We are people before we are editors, people before we are employees. However, I believe there's also a responsibility that you have knowing that you have this specific disability. And anybody that knows me knows that I say that everybody has a disability. Every single person has some form of disability. And so I'm not saying it's like this this horrible thing and whatever. Um, we all have our own disabilities, but you need to be honest with yourself and say, am I still able to bring my best to the job and do the job? Because there are going to be certain disabilities that you might have where you just have to accept the fact that this might not be the best environment for me. So if I know that I don't get four hours of sunlight every day, I'm going to be in an emergency room, I probably don't want to be an editor. Like that That's just something that you have to accept. But on the other end of that, you have to also be willing to own the fact that let's you use the word diabetes, right? So let's say that I have type one diabetes. You have to own the fact that I have it. It's a part of my life and it's who that I am. I'm going to learn how to manage it. But diabetes doesn't have me. There's a difference between those two and using it as a constant excuse for, oh, I, you know, I can't do this or I can't do that because I've got this or that. It's like, well, You kind of put yourself in the position to have this job where you knew that these were going to be the responsibilities. So 
make sure that these are responsibilities you can handle given whatever your disability might be, but just don't get to the point where you use it as an excuse. But to come back to the beginning, we are people first and we should be managing our health before we're just trying to get the job done. So I don't know if that totally answers your question, but... I wouldn't tell him. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't tell him. I think that you, uh, I've had enough, I've lived long enough to see the smallest thing held against a person. And anything that you've just described does not, um, uh, in my mind, um, prevent a person from having a job uh, in the film business. Um, with a decent uh, office manager, um, I, I don't. I don't hear it. I, I work with someone who has diabetes, um, and he's the senior editor on the on the on the hallway. Um, other things, um, allergies, perhaps uh, something that would environmental. We're all sensitive too, um, and something an, an environment that might trigger something, but, but none of the things that you've, you've said as examples would I ever bring up. Uh, and Whoopi Goldberg said, don't tell him. I mean, she, when people would ask her, did, when does she ever bring up race? She said, she, just don't tell him. You know, and I've had experience, uh, uh, I'll be honest, uh, uh, teaching at a, a college was not at USC, it was one of the other places I taught. I found out that when I told the people the students that I was the first African American female member of ACE, um, I got worse reviews. Same teacher, same class, same kind of class, no real difference. When I didn't tell them, I got much better reviews. I mean, significantly better. So you answer that. It, it had never occurred to me, and I just conducted an experiment. So it was two terms and then another two terms. And um, for some people, it was a difference. It was not to me, but I thought they'd be happy, but they weren't. And it was not, a, you know, not an Ivy League, not where you might expect to find it. So, uh, going on that, I'm an educator, and so this has been a great panel. How can we uh, uh, teach this at the beginning levels of post production education? So for, for, so for those of you that might not have heard it in the back, the, the question is, this gentleman is an educator and wants to know how we can teach this, the kind of topics that are being talked about today at the early levels of education. Um, I'll take it because I used to teach public school. Um, and Well, what I would tell is at this particular school, I, I told the students, mostly because I had women, I said, if it feels wrong, it is wrong. And I saw the change in their faces, and I thought, hmm, I need to say this all the time. Um, if you um, teach them reward, the ones who are empathetic, um, teach fairness, uh, teach them how to praise each other and support each other. That's one of the things that is the most important in this industry. Um, encourage them to be physical. Because we can talk about the um, technical. That is the first thing I look for in an assistant now because I'm not so good at that. But then I look at character. And I have been fooled. And I've been fooled badly. Um, but I try to look at character. Um, and that you can teach. That has nothing to I mean, that's everyday stuff. Don't lie. Warn somebody if you know something's going to happen. Don't let, don't bully. I mean, it's kind of, and I don't know if you teach high school. What do, what do you teach? College. College, just tell them don't be mean, you know? Yeah, yeah. Really, I mean, because so much of what is wrong with this industry is because people think they can just be mean and they can get away with it. And I haven't stopped the bullies in my life all the time. You know, I, I've worked for people I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have stayed. But um, it is about creativity and, and what everybody on this panel has said. Um, you can't be who you want to be. You can't succeed if you don't. Uh, you can't have the passion um, if you um, 
or allow people to diminish you. But uh, conversely, I think if you diminish others, you cannot be the creative person that you are. And, and that's not, people don't talk about that. People believe they can be mean. And some people succeed at being mean, but I don't want to be them and I don't want to be around them. But that's, you know, and, and I don't get certain jobs because I don't want to be around that person. Yeah, please. One thing. Um, <clears throat> I, I have always tried to surround myself, as far as my assistants are concerned, <clears throat> with what I would call generous people, people who are very gracious and who can actually talk to you about life issues and not live in isolation. I think that's probably one of the things that you can impart to your students is that we do not work or live in a vacuum. What we edit actually affects us, affects others. And it's very important to be mindful of that. And there are many young assistants that I interview or talk to, and I am always drawn to those that I feel have a very human dimension in the way that they look at their work. Um, I suppose that's along the same lines, but yes. Yeah, and one quick thing that I would add to it as well, they're looking at it from a very holistic, emotional level, which I think is great. As a teacher, if you're looking at it from very much brass tacks curriculum, here are the things I want to teach This the, on the checklist, this on the checklist, they have to learn Avid or they have to learn Premiere or they have to learn how to cut a scene or manage bins or dailies, like really, you know, detailed stuff. Think to yourself, one of the core fundamental pieces of information that my students should leave this room with is habits. What should my habits be in the edit room? Because guess where a lot of this starts? It starts in colleges where these students, and I was one of them, sleep in the edit suite. I slept in the edit suite for entire semesters thinking, well, this is the way to get the job done to the best of my ability. And then you just carry that culture through to an industry that just perpetuates this and throws gasoline on the fire. So think to yourself, for example, like I, I taught at USC for a few semesters and I had a three hour course once a week. And I never let more than 60 minutes go by where we didn't all get up. Super simple, small habit. But I was instilling in them that part of the creative process is movement. So I would talk for an hour and we'd all be sitting there and say, all right, let's just all take two minutes, stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down. That's it. But they would tell me afterwards, you know, I still kind of do that. That's a habit that I still do, whether it's in the edit suite, I find I get up more. So if you are looking for just one little small thing that you want to add to a curriculum that you don't need like, you know, dean approval for, just remind your kids that they need to get up and move a little bit more throughout the day. And they're going to take those habits with them for the rest of their career. We, we have that. Yeah, I know. They're kicking us home again. <laughs> um, I'm not, yeah. Notorious yes. Not yeah. We want to be respectful for keeping this thing on time. Um, so uh, action items. The ACE best practices guide, it's up there on the table. Check that out. Uh, optimize yourself. Avail yourself of the resources that uh, Zach has. And uh, you go see my friend Michael Krulik over at the table at lunch and get one of these avid. Re remind you to, to you know take care of yourself a little bit. Uh, I started this panel off saying I had no idea where it was going to go, but I knew it would be great. In a rare turn of events, I was right on both counts. Um, <laughs> so please, ladies and gentlemen, help me thank our panelists today. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. Thank you for listening to episode 50 of the Optimize Yourself podcast. To access the show notes for this episode, please visit optimizeyourself.me slash episode 50. If you enjoyed this episode, I want to remind you before you go to help support future episodes by leaving an honest review of the show in iTunes or Apple Podcasts. If you do leave a review, you're going to be entered to win a yearly subscription to Adobe Creative Cloud, an essential package of video creation tools that I personally cannot live without. Whether you're cutting your very first clip, you're creating Hollywood blockbusters such as Deadpool, or you're making critically acclaimed shows such as Atlanta or Mindhunter, Adobe has the tools that you need to bring your stories to the web, TV, or to film. What's even cooler about Creative Cloud is how easily you can move from ingest to editing and from color grading to 3D compositing, for example, thanks to all of the smooth integration between Premiere Pro, After Effects, and Audition. To learn more about the products that Adobe Creative Cloud has to offer, visit optimizeyourself.me slash Adobe. And to win yourself that yearly subscription, just leave an honest review of this show in iTunes or Apple Podcasts. 
And if that isn't enough to get you excited, you can also enter to win the 12-month pro plan from my newest sponsor, Frame.io, an amazing online collaboration tool where you can comment and interact directly with your videos, providing instant feedback online, rather than constantly going back and forth via endless email chains. And you know how I feel about email and productivity. Even cooler, your comments can be imported directly into your editing software of choice, and it is so intuitive, easy to use, and dare I say pretty, that Frame.io even won an Apple Design Award. Stop patching together your email, your Dropbox, and Vimeo, and YouTube, and instead, just do yourself a favor and visit optimizeyourself.me slash Frame.io. And for clarification, that's Frame.io with no periods or spaces. And do not forget to leave that podcast review in iTunes to be entered to win. Thank you for listening. Be well. This episode of the Optimize Yourself podcast was made possible for you by ErgoDriven, the makers of the Topomat, my number one recommendation for anybody interested in moving more at their height-adjustable workstation. Listen, standing desks are only great if you're standing well. Otherwise, you're constantly fighting fatigue and chronic pain. Not like any other anti-fatigue mat, the Topo is scientifically proven to help you move more throughout the day, which helps reduce discomfort and also increase your focus and productivity. I'm standing on one as I read this, and I don't go to a single job without it. And if you're smaller and you're concerned that the Topo mat is too big, or you simply don't have the floor space, there's a Topo Mini for that. To learn more, visit optimizeyourself.me slash Topo. That's T-O-P-O. This episode is also made possible for you by Sit Tight, the desk chair that has instantly become my number one recommendation if you are searching for a healthier, more ergonomically friendly office chair. Sit Tight is an active sitting chair that uses your body's natural ability to balance to activate your postural muscles. You know, those are the muscles that hurt all the time because you're slouched over a keyboard all day long. Well, using the sit tight causes a significant increase in your heart rate, it increases brain activity, and it causes a sensation that's similar to riding a bike, which also brings just a bit of fun into the workplace. Simply put, the sit tight turns sitting into an activity that actually improves your health rather than damaging it, so you can get fit while you sit. If you want to learn more about this revolutionary new desk chair that I have fallen in love with and how it can provide fitness for your body, focus for your mind, and fun for your spirit, just visit optimizeyourself.me slash sit tight and use the coupon code optimize for 10% off your order.